evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Welcome to this Clare Hall Clare discussion, Hall. Um, Zoom discussion on Arctic culture and climate. We've got a bit of an echo. Is there anything we can do about that? Um, everyone needs to mute who can. Uh, everyone who isn't speaking needs to mute. Yeah. Good. I just want to begin this evening by thanking uh, Claire Hall for all the help that's been given towards this evening and to thank two members of staff in particular, Catherine Wise and Katrina Wilkinson. Without Katrina's calmness and management of Zoom, we would not be here this evening. Clare Hall was the first modern college within the University of Cambridge and originally it was based on the Princeton model. It formed a centre for advanced study and visiting fellows, visiting fellowships uh, continue to attract scholars from around the world to Clare Hall to this day. On returning home they become life members and uh, life members of Clare Hall and we are delighted that some of them are present this evening um, from their various different countries, thereby helping to make this a truly international event. My name is Frances Spaulding and I chair the Clare Hall Art Committee. Um, I'm helped this evening by Fiona Blake, who is the secretary to that committee. And in normal times, we run a continuous programme of exhibitions. Clare Hall is very good with its inter cultural, intellectual and social events, which happen very frequently. But these are not normal times and we are not able to open the college to the public. So hence Zoom. Um, recently, when I visited the British Museum's exhibition Arctic Culture and Climate, in fact, it wasn't very recently, it was uh, back in September, soon after it opened, I wondered when I heard that it was going to close if we could create an event that related to it, given that one of Clare Hall's long-standing fellows is Peter Wadhams, Professor Peter Wadhams, formerly director of the Scott Polar Institute and an internationally renowned authority on the Arctic Ocean. He is, of course, one of our speakers tonight, but before introducing the other two, I want to give you a brief glimpse of the inside of the British Museum's exhibition, just so that we all get a taste or a reminder of the Arctic. Oh dear. Sorry. Um, share screen. Well, here we are. This is the um, part of the first room in the exhibition. It's where the costumes are on display, made out of animal skins and fur and other things. And I just want to point out right at the beginning that this is an exhibition very well designed. It uses a variety of media. You'll see the map projected onto the floor. As you go around the corner and into the main part of the exhibition, you find that it uses objects, photographs and film. And indeed, if we see, go towards that sled, a dog sled just behind there and um, we see the actual object but behind it is a running film showing huskies pulling just that kind of sled through the landscape at great speed and so it gives us some idea of what it is like for long distance travel um, in the in the arctic um, elsewhere we find a, a great deal of remarkable uh, creative work um, it, you see here a pair of boots, very beautifully uh, embroidered. Um, the purpose behind this exhibition is, I think, two twofold. It's partly to remind us that um, the uh, Arctic is warming at twice the pace of anywhere else, and that the research predicts that it will be ice-free in just 80 years. And secondly, the purpose of this exhibition, is, as these boots show you, is to give you a glimpse into the culture created by indigenous Arctic peoples. A way of life that over 30,000 years, through innovation and collaboration, has adapted to natural climate variability, but which today, as we know, is being made increasingly fragile by a rapid form of climate change, which is man-made. It is the way this exhibition explores the human face of the Arctic alongside scientific facts 
that I think makes it so very moving. Incidentally, I have rung the British Museum today to find out when they hope it will open again. And they say they hope in December, but of course it depends on government directives. But it does go on into January, so there is hope that it will be open to the public um, in the future again. Um, I think the remarkable craft skills, skills seen here are also found repeatedly throughout the show, but most notably in the medium of carving. And later on this evening, Maria Pia Wadhams, former director of the Zavati Polar Institute in Italy, will demonstrate this to us with more images. We have to remember things like the way the sunlight bounces off the ice and snow in spring can be so bright that there is a danger of blindness. And among the wonderful objects on display is this pair of snow goggles. They're made out of re uh, reindeer skin and decorated with beads uh, and they come from like late 19th century. And finally, I want to show you a quotation that is found high up on a wall in the exhibition um, by Sheila Watt Coutier. It, it reads, as you can see, to live in a boundless landscape and a close-knit culture in which everything matters and everything is connected is a kind of magic. Like generations of Inuit, I bonded with the ice and snow. I think this is the same lady who is famous for saying, we have a right to be cold. Well, we'll just pass these icing clouds and now go back to the, um, sorry, share, stop share. And if I could just um, point out if one or two more things before we move on to the first talk, the first to hand over to Peter Wadhams. Um, Peter is, of course, a scientific expert, as I've mentioned, author of A Farewell to Ice, which is readily available as a penguin paperback, and who will be in discussion with Sarah Wheeler, an award-winning travel writer, author of many books, among them The Magnetic North, Travels in the Arctic, a vintage paperback, and who is currently the Royal Literary Fund uh, Fellow at Bracelows College in Oxford. But before they enter into discussion with each other, each will talk separately for 10 minutes from their own particular vantage point on the Arctic. Now, if while listening to them, succinct questions come to mind, uh, do please enter them in the chat box. We, unfortunately, more, com well, more complex or professional matter we, we do advise can be directed to them personally via email. And that's why we put the emails of all three speakers in the invitation to you, the, which shows you the um, meeting ID identity and the, uh, and the password. So you can find their emails if you wish to be in contact with them. But I must warn you that owing to the size of the audience tonight, we will only be able to deal with very few questions. The good news, however, is that this event is being recorded and will be posted up on the Clare Hall website uh, a week or so after this event. Peter, over to you. Peter Wadhams. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to speak from the, the vantage point of climate change, because I think that's at the moment the most serious thing that's affecting the Arctic, because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's happening much faster in the Arctic than in other parts of the world, and is leading to the loss of ice, which is which is a, um, a, a major change and a major disaster, I think, for the world. So uh, as, uh, as Francis has said, I wrote a book on this called uh, Farewell to Ice, and uh, which was stole, the title stolen from Hemingway. Firstly, uh, the, 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 I, I, as I was saying, I wrote a book on this, which uh, Francis mentioned, and it deals with this question of the, the fact that the disappearance of ice from the Arctic and um, is um, something which is affecting the entire world. The feedbacks from that uh, loss of ice um, are felt throughout the world and uh, there's, there's no, everything is linked together in climate, but, but there's, there's a special link between loss of ice and other changes in, in, the, in the climate of the world, including uh, sea level rise, which is a very serious problem. So uh, another, uh, Another thing which, which deals with the same question uh, is a film which uh, I also 
and um, not exactly a starring, but I have a bit part in it um, called Ice on Fire, which is a feature film uh, produced by Leonardo DiCaprio. And it deals with, with the same issues of climate change and especially issues like um, methane emissions from the Arctic, which are potentially going to cause a very major leap in global warming. So this actually shows a researcher who's looking at methane emissions from the Arctic and experiencing them in his own body in the sense that he just poked his stick into a frozen lake uh, with uh, methane gas underneath, which has released itself from the lake and is now burning. Um, so the, uh, the problem with warming is that nothing we can do seems to stop it. This is the record of temperature um, in, um, done from an observatory on a volcano in Hawaii, Mauna Loa. And they've been keeping a continuous record of carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere since 1958. And um, what it shows is that carbon dioxide content, which is directly related to warming, it's what causes the main cause of global warming, it's been going up and it's been going up in an accelerated way and nothing we can say or do and none of the agreements that we've made have had the slightest effect on it. The, the Paris Climate Agreement uh, doesn't show in this at all and earlier agreements or earlier plans that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had uh, haven't been reflected at all. We, we're simply uh, real delinquents, we are not reducing our carbon emissions, even whatever politicians say. The reality is measured by the, the instrument on the volcano and it says we're not doing it. And uh, the warming that's resulting is much greater in the Arctic than in other parts of the world. Uh, the temperature rise is about three times as great at higher Arctic latitudes than in any other latitudes north or south. So the, this has produced very big changes. And um, this is the way things used to be in my youth when I used to go to the Arctic first of all. Um, this is what you'd see there. It's called multi-year ice. It's, it's really thick and rugged and really difficult to, to make any progress on it. Uh, if you want to walk anywhere, if you want to walk to the North Pole, it would be an extremely difficult thing to do uh, because of this, this very, very thick ice. Today that's gone and all we have left is first year ice. And uh, we saw, uh, Francis showed that very nice picture of uh, sledge dogs uh, in the Arctic. And here's uh, a similar picture. Uh, and I, I took this in Northwest Greenland at, uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's winter ice. So it's, it's only about a meter or so thick. Uh, and uh, in the background, there's an iceberg that's that came into the fjord during the, the winter, during the summer and froze in. Now, um, the, the, these are two sledges used by uh, Inuit hunters uh, in, in, in the village. And um, you can see the one I was on is they're both oak sledges, very heavy. Normally you think about sledges being as light as possible, but here they have to carry the load of whatever they catch, like killing a polar bear, which can be very, very heavy. And so we see uh, uh, heavy oak sledges uh, going around, being used for hunting. Now, um, recently they've been finding more and more cases where the, the, the sledges have gone through the ice because the ice is thinner than it used to be. And uh, that's, of course, can be fatal. And so, when we were up there, uh, we, uh, I was part of our European project and we found a way to install little uh, radar systems on the bottoms of these sledges. So the, the hunter would get a signal uh, on if, if the ice became too thin, so it became dangerous. So he'd get, he'd get the warning signal and of course we get the data to use later for analysing how the ice thickness changed. So we have been able to, to help the Inuit not, not get killed. Um, of course, this is what they're hunting and polar bears are going to become rarer and rarer 
in the Arctic because they're losing their hunting grounds because when after they've um, spent the winter um, my, hibernating in, in along the coast in snow holes, they come out, they want to be able to hunt on the sea ice uh, for seals because they haven't eaten for a long time. Suddenly there isn't any sea ice there anymore. That result will mean a complete loss of habitat for polar bears. Another effect that's happening, which is linked to the loss of sea ice, is that the loss of sea ice um, allows warmer air to sort of waft through the Arctic in the summer uh, and move up over the Greenland ice sheet, although that's 10,000 feet above sea level. Um, the, the, uh, the warm air causes the ice sheet to melt. And this never used to happen because it's so high up. It was very, very cold even in the summer. But now in the summer, we have this complete change. And on this particular day, I happened to be on the ice cap on the 1st of August last year, which had the biggest single daily loss of ice uh, ever since records began, which is 12 and a half billion tonnes melted off the ice cap on that one day. And uh, that, of course, goes straight down uh, into the ocean and causes sea level rise. So the biggest cause of sea level rise now is the Greenland ice cap melting, and that's uh, uh, causing an acceleration of sea level rise, which will be disastrous for uh, coastal cities and uh, coastal communities. Um, the, it's accelerated as well by the fact that as the ice melts, it leaves behind all the dirt that it accumulated over hundreds of years of dust and dirt falling on the ice cap. Um, the, each, each year it will be covered by new white snowfall, but now it's just melting and the, the water goes away, but leaves the dirt behind. And what we have now is this, this nasty stuff called black ice, which is the dirt left over from the, when the ice melts. It's not even slippery. You, you, if you walk on it, you, you don't feel this is ice, but it causes the ice to be darker. And when it's darker, it melts more rapidly. So this is accelerating sea level, by accelerating ice melt and therefore accelerating sea level rise is this darkening of the ice. Here, here it is. And here we see some meltwater flowing away down a newly created uh, kind of rapid river, which wasn't there before. And um, so that's, those are some of, very briefly, some of the things which are going on in the Arctic. Um, and it's affecting, of course, the habitat for everybody, for, for the human race, because the, the, the sea level rise now, which, which may be um, more than one meter, it, the, the official figure that we're going to have is a meter by the year 2100. But the scientists who work up there, um, including a very good friend of mine who unfortunately was killed on the Greenland ice cap uh, this summer, um, were, have always been finding that, that the ice melting and flowing away, flowing down through holes towards the, the seabed, uh, the, the, the bedrock, uh, is going to be producing a sea level rise of something more like three or four meters by the end of the century. And that will be a disaster because it will mean the complete loss of, um, of coastal cities and a lot of loss uh, from coastal regions where they can't afford to raise the height of sea defences, like Bangladesh, um, for instance. So sea level rise will be a disaster. And it's coming out of the fact that the ice, the Arctic is warming and the sea ice is disappearing. And so we can expect, uh, so um, as I said, the ice will disappear in 80 years. I think that that is true that the sea level in, that, that, that the ice in, in uh, winter, in summer uh, is going to disappear very much more quickly than that. Um, maybe in the next year or two, uh, it's, it's looking as it's looking uh, like is that the, the, the loss of ice is going very much more rapidly. The, the winter ice may well last 80 years, so it'll be 80 years before everything goes. But at the moment, we might expect to find an ice-free summer maybe next year.
Oh, Peter, thank you very much indeed for right there, the, those facts and figures. Thank you. Um, and now we're going to pass to Sarah, to Sarah Wheeler. Sarah, are you there? I am here. Good. I'm really waiting. <laughs> to look at to to tell us a little bit about your view of the art of Arctic from a that of a travel writer. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, I'll um, just uh, start talking and wait till the screens catch up with me. Wasn't that absolutely fascinating? Once read so many articles um, about uh, uh, what Peter's just described, but there's nothing like hearing it from a world expert um, from his mouth. And it was whilst it was terrifying, I thought it's absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much, Peter. So um, I am a generalist. Um, really on the basis that someone's got to be one. Um, and I um, made quite a few circumpolar journeys in order to write a book um, about um, the culture of the far north of the Arctic in all its many man manifestations. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the culture that I found um, there. Um, but first of all, I'm gonna show you this. Um, Fiona, can you get me on full screen so people can see this? I don't. Um, you should be on full screen to anyone, anyone who go, go to the right hand corner and put you on full screen. As soon as you start talking, you will be on full screen for Isn't those. Isn't it a, um, a speak of you people need to put in the corner? Yeah, speak you of you. Click on speak of you. You'll get the person who's speaking in the, in the main box. So speak again, Sarah, you'll come into the main box. <laughs> Okay, um, so this, if you can see it there, is a, a carved walrus baculum. As you know, a baculum is a bone. So you see how long it is, it's rather a beautiful thing. Um, it's in fact a penis bone, a walrus penis bone. Um, and anyway, these were sacred to the indigenous peoples of the Russian Far East. So I'm talking about Chukotka. If you set off from Moscow and you go eight time zones, eventually get to the Russian Far East, this enormous region, the size of France with no roads, and it's called Chukotka, and it's all um, in the Arctic, um, 650,000 kilometers square. Probably one of the only things people have never heard about it, not experts like you people, but the public is when, do you remember in Sarah Palin's failed presidential campaign, she said, I can see Russia from my window. Well, that's what she could see because she's in Alaska and it's terribly close to Alaska and very far from anywhere else. And in fact, um, when I was at the exhibition at the British Museum that Francis mentioned, one of the first things I saw was a photograph of a man called Edward uh, Zor there, whom I met when I was in Chukotka and I interviewed him and he is president of the Chukotka Marine Mammals Association and what he was doing when I was there in Anadir, the capital of Chukotka, was negotiating for the quota of bowhead and grey whales for the Chukchi. Now the Chukchi, they're the indigenous peoples of the uh, Russian Far East of Chukotka and they were very um, held in great regard by the Cossacks who of course went marauding through the land and um, they, the Cossacks brought back stories about their prowess, the Chukchi prowess, like they could, they killed a migrating geese who they wanted to eat, of course, by throwing, just throwing balls at them. They were so skilled at doing that kind of thing. Um, and they milked their reindeer by sucking the teats themselves and spitting it into bowls. And anyway, the stories of the Chukchi were legendary. And um, in our own day, there's a rather distinguished uh, Chukchi poet whom I recommend to you called Yuri um, Riktu. However, and this is a story I'm going to come back to in various places in the Arctic. It's rather a sad tale, the usual story of indigenous peoples being dragged into a cash economy by more powerful non-indigenous government. And the Chukchi are among the most benighted of many benighted uh, groups in the Russian Arctic. Um, struggling to keep going as marine mammal hunters with these quotas I mentioned, but um, it's, it's quite... Um, Quite a it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's tough. But I want to say something else about Chukotka, which is that this is not all about indigenous peoples. It's all about Russians and it's going to be about Canadians and people who aren't indigenous. They have their culture and they live in the Arctic too. Now, Anadir, as I said, is the capital of Chukotka. And I think all you need to know really about the culture there is um, that um, on a telegraph pole, I saw a sign, handwritten sign, like a small ad. Um, advertising a flat, a two bedroom flat in return for a one way plane ticket to Moscow. 
Um, there's not really much to keep you there. Um, but there is a supermarket, which is quite new. Don't forget, I've told you it's the size of France and there's no roads. There is a supermarket, which is a big new thing. Um, of course, everything is flown in from many thousands of miles away. Some of it, would you believe, even from uh, west of the Urals in that industrial belt, west of the Urals, it's just absurd. Um, and my piece de resistance was I found that they were even importing from a factory south of Petersburg, Arctic roll. And sometimes as a writer, you find something and you think, I just don't want that to have happened because no one's gonna believe me. Anyway, it did happen and it's all. Um, and I do mostly, when I travel, I do mostly homestays, which is actually a very easy thing to organize in Russia. And of course, it's great for a writer because you hang around with people. And um, this marvelous couple, elderly couple, and um, I, uh, I, I stayed with, and when I came into the kitchen one morning and they, were, they had a badminton racket, which they must have got from landfill and a huge, great lump of some sort of row of some fish. It wasn't sturgeon, but... And they were going in time with this badminton racket, taking it in turns, because that's what you do with a lump of roe to get the eggs to fall through. And one of them was reciting the bronze horseman. I'm not making that up either. Okay. Um, now, language, of course, is a cornerstone of culture. Everywhere in the world, language is a cornerstone. And um, there's many, many uh, languages spoken across the Russian Arctic alone, even before we go through the other Arctic countries. Um, so with the Arctic and the subarctic, it's Turkic, Uralic, Tungus, Man Manchu. And my favorite is Ket, because it's a language unrelated to any other. How exciting is that? And how did they manage it? Anyway, um, part of the dragging into the cash economy um, was, of course, um, in Soviet times, they tried to obliterate the indigenous languages, they were not, people weren't allowed to speak them, and the usual story. But they also had to be able to communicate the Soviets with their people. And uh, so people, uh, the, the linguistics experts from the Mo Institute in Moscow were duly taken up, and in one of the republics in the middle, in the centre of the Russian Arctic, there's a story recorded of um, this event where in the Yaranga, which is the equivalent of the town hall, is a tent, this linguistics expert, somebody who was uh, appointed to be a sort of um, translator and somebody else sitting down there trying to make these people tell the basic words so that the process could start. The Russians like to call it uh, likbez, the liquidation of illiteracy, as if it was some great thing bringing culture to these people, so it wasn't anything to do with that, of course. Anyway, this went on and it's recorded this process of this meeting in the Uranga. So they started off, as you might imagine, with the easy concepts, numbers, one stone, and so stone, stone, Russian, written down number two, two stones, two, 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 so it goes on, did three stones. They got to four, had four stones there. And the people said, what are you talking about? It goes one, two, three, many. And there were no words for numbers after three. And I'm not telling you this story to show any lack of sophistication. I'm telling you it to show how the difficult it is to try and integrate a language, even in a benign way, which was not what the Soviets had in mind. It's very, di it's very difficult. And language then as now um, has always been um, a great difficulty. Um, it didn't help that these linguists from Moscow insisted at first on codifying everything into a Roman script. God knows why. The Soviets often had these completely pointless ideas. And so nobody could understand, nobody could read that at all, anybody. And it was about 30 years later, so they finally put it all into Cyrillic. Anyway, so since the Chukchi were hurling their balls to down their migrating geese, um, from then until now, uh, that conflict and contrast, the Cossacks when they encountered Chukchi, I've talked about dragging into the cash economy, but the conflict between them and now has existed all around the second polar north um, and still does. And I saw it on my travels in lots of different um, ways. Um, in Canada, for example, I was spent some while in uh, on Southampton Island, which is one of the sort of corks in um, in uh, Hudson Bay there, and I went out um, hunting with some a couple of young men, Indigenous men, who had learned skills from their fathers. I can't remember what we were hunting. I don't know if I ever knew. It was probably caribou. Anyway, they were extremely um, agreeable and friendly and uh, nice and um, being Canadian spoke very good English which was great for me I could talk to them and um, 
they were very interested in their landscape and their environment and their wildlife and constantly showing me things about the um, little bit of um, flora that there was there. It's one of the few places in the Circumpolar Arctic where anything grows. And um, then towards the end of the afternoon, talk drifted to what was going to be going on that evening. And they were talking very animated way about going home to play poker stars on the internet. And I'm telling you that as a positive story because integration has to occur in some way. No one's gonna carry on living in the, in the far north, throwing stones at geese, balls at geese and eating them. There has to be some kind of integration and it's a writer's duty to have hope. And I, I wanna tell you at least one positive story and, and uh, there's but many positive stories many positive stories um, and um, uh, so just going over to Alaska of course going up to, I, went, I went up to the, the very the coast the coast of north of Alaska there you follow the transatlantic trans Alaska pipeline sorry to mention that um, up um, through the Brooks Mountain range it's very 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 beautiful um, part of the United States very beautiful then you get to the coast at the top where um, all the oil happens um, and uh, I was going to read you a little passage but I don't think we've got time but I'll just say that um, uh, 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 well there was one fellow this is in Dead Horse and the passage on Dead Horse starts as for Dead Horse it was a dead loss so I'll, I'll spare you all of that but there was this um, guy there um, uh, called um, what was he called? Charlie Hobson. And he was a subsistence bowhead hunter. Now, most people up there, you know what I'm talking about, in the north coast of Alaska, indigenous and non-indigenous alike, they um, work for BP. Um, but this, this fellow didn't, although his daughter um, uh, uh, and his son were working, one as a mechanical engineer and one in catering at Prudhoe Bay, which is the main... Um, um, exploration um, part, as you know, and that they, that huge and massive pipeline goes goes all the way down. Um, and um, uh, I remember there was a notice pinned on a board at, at the uh, BP station alerting um, the Inupiat workforce to a forthcoming general meeting in Barrow, two hundred miles away, to discuss proposals to raise hunting quotas. It's interesting. I heard that same thing going on. Um, and um, this fellow, Charlie Hobson, whom I mentioned, he said, uh, we as Inupiat have been the guardians of the Arctic for thousands of years. And they have been, and I hope they still can be, and I think they still can be. So quickly going on, um, Peter's mentioned Greenland. Um, again, I saw this, this coming together. I saw in Nuuk, which is the capital, not that far from Kanga that uh, Peter was talking about, uh, pegged on a washing line, I saw curing seal ribs and a nylon child Superman suit next to one another. So everywhere you see this double, double thing. Um, of course, it was a double, double conflict, conflict there in, in Greenland because the Greenlandic peoples, indigenous peoples, uh, are owned, they, their country is owned by uh, Denmark. And um, even though they have now independ some nominal independence, um, and of course, so that's, they don't have anything to do with Denmark, these indigenous Greenlanders, so they have that double thing. Um, and here too, of course, is a big language story. Um, uh, Greenland got its first cinema in 1965, which was some time before its first bank, or its first avocado comes with that. And um, there's a great account of this cinema in 1965 in the south of Greenland, because of course the films were subtitled into Danish. And of course, nobody spoke Danish. So every 10 minutes, the bloke, oh, well, he wasn't going like this, was he? But whatever he was doing to show the film would stop the film, come to the front of the cinema and give a 10 minute translation of what had just occurred. That was how the cinema went on. And um, I'm going to move now to, a, um, a, coming to my end here about um, missionaries. Now, missionaries, it's not all bad. The story of missionaries in the circumpolar Arctic is not all bad by a long way, but there's quite a, a good account um, by um, 
a missionary in the south of Greenland, um, which gives us actually lots and lots of detail, which is what we what we want. Um, and uh, he was the first fellow um, to translate the Lord's Prayer into Inuktitut. And of course, it was uh, give us this day our daily seal. And yes, you know, that's funny. I'm not really telling it to you as a big joke. I'm telling you, um, well, why shouldn't he have translated it as, as that? And why shouldn't they understand the Lord's Prayer? just like we do. I think probably um, we will move on at that stage from, uh, from missionaries, but I am going to read you to finish one paragraph um, because the subject of religion, like language, of course, is um, a big part of culture. And religion is not really the word I'm, I want. What I'm talking about is the innate characteristic of the human to reach out towards the transcendental. I believe that's one of the things that distinguishes the human being from the other type of beings, that need to reach out towards the transcendental, the spiritual component. And uh, I write about that a lot in, in all my work. I'm very interested in it. And of course, religion that, that came from all of that. But before there was religion in any sense that we understand it, it that's, what, that's what it is, isn't it? It's there is something that makes us, most of us want to reach out towards the transcendental and there's so many manifestations of that. And uh, um, I was just gonna read you something that uh, I, again, I'm going back, finishing off in the Russian Arctic where I started, but the other side, so the White Sea. So this is the European Arctic. And there's some um, archipelago in the White Sea called Solovki, Sol Solovetsky Islands. And um, they're very, very beautiful and uh, were the site of um, the first monastery and this and that, very, very sacred to orthodoxy and also the site of the first gulag. And we have lots of details of that gulag. And um, so um, I don't need to say any more about that, do I? But um, uh, um, so um, but before the Soviets and before gulags and before orthodoxy and before monasteries and before everything. There were peoples who put in at those White Sea Islands, um, Neolithic people, all kinds of peoples of all different different types because they were, it was, it's, it's quite sheltered the White Sea in many places in the southern part. So they could get their stop off, get their water, do, do what people, people used to do, transhuman people. Um, they didn't settle there, but what they did do as early peoples often did, was made these extraordinary marks on the ground. So it's not like Stonehenge, but it's the same sort of idea. And there's some sort of sacred component to whorls and so on in very, very intricate patterns, really, really early. They're there in the Arctic. They are a cultural sign of um, what Arctic peoples um, have been doing. We can only speculate as to its meaning. And um, so, um, I had been there to this island, Solovki Island, the main one, and um, you had to get a, a converted fishing boat to, to get there and back. Um, and um, so I was on the way back and I was thinking about these whorls, whorls, this, these patterns on the ground. And this is how my book um, ends. The White Sea picked up speed and out on deck, salty spray sent the others hurrying into the cabin. A mist had fallen over the distant domes, those are the onion domes of the monastery. What had the first fishermen made of it as they piloted their flimsy craft across the water centuries before Solzhenitsyn, he was at that gulag and read about it. <laughs> Did they lay out their stones for their labyrinth spirals as a way of reaching towards some unobtainable transcendental truth? Or did the stones mark the edges of a Bronze Age rubbish dump? The trawler chugged to the coast over wells of oil speculators had not yet sunk. Either way, the mossy whorls revealed the human spirit at work, stretching back across oceans of time. They were manifestations of the human need to make order. It was better not to know. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for a fantastic introduction and explanation of the... I think you, in your book you mentioned the opacity that you sometimes feel about the Arctic regions and how 
no coherent picture is, is, is it, it's so difficult to obtain a coherent picture of it all. But you've certainly given us information that just there that gives us some idea of the complexity and the paradoxes that are, are found within it. I wonder if this, this uh, the opposition to integration is something that, um, that not only you observe, but maybe Peter too has observed in, uh, from the scientific point of view, but I'm not sure. Maybe is this something that might open up a discussion between the two of you? Yes, it, it could be. Um, I don't think, thinking about um, cultures where the, the, the government is not the same as the people um, does make me think a bit of, of Greenland and uh, the, the way things changed there when they got home rule so that the, the Greenlanders who are not 100% Inuit, but largely Inuit, um, were given what was thought, what they thought to be independence, or at least something that would lead to independence, but Denmark didn't think it was independence because Denmark wanted to hang on to the natural resources. So there was this tension. And uh, I went to a meeting there and uh, the, the prime minister of Greenland had just got married. And, uh, the interesting thing is he got married in a Viking church because the Vikings had settled in Greenland. So we see three cultures now, this church, which was semi-derelict, but only semi-derelict. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of churches in England that are <laughs> very nearly as bad. And, uh, and it was the first time a wedding had been held in that church for 500 years. I wanted to ask Peter if uh, if you'd experienced um, if you'd had contact in your work with indigenous peoples or indeed just local people not necessarily indigenous ones who had had anxiety of their own about the declining ice because they'd they'd mm. seen it experienced it well, very very much um, in uh, as as you've talked about Barrow the the people of Barrow are especially concerned because as the sea ice retreats, uh, it gets much stormier along the coast. You've got much more open water and you're getting now big storms coming in and causing real damage to the coast. Um, villages are having to be abandoned and repositioned. And uh, it's, it's a big disaster for the people uh, having the ice retreating. So they're very, very concerned about that. And they recognize, of course, that it's happening because uh, they're finding their village being swept away. Um, so yes, it is a big problem. Yes. I was also going to ask you, Peter, from a scientist's point of view, about the Northern Sea Route. That's what I still think of it as being called, because it's what the explorers used to call it, which is, um, as most of you in the audience, I'm sure, all know, is the, well, the northern, northern coast of Russia, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, everything is said about uh, the way to the riches of Cathay, for which Franklin perished on the other mm -hmm. side. But the Northern Sea Route was incredibly important, wasn't it, to the Soviets? And um, then it sort of freezes up for nine months of the year, or correct me if I'm wrong. And now there's a lot of talk of it melting out. And so, um, uh, I mean, what, is it going to melt? Is, it, is that going to be open water for trade vessels year round? Um, it will be, yes, um, eventually. But at the moment, it's, it's, it's a reliable trade route in the summer months. And um, uh, the Russians are, are using it a lot. Um, but uh, quite a, amusingly, and actually quite seriously, this buffoon who is the uh, present uh, American Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, um, and uh, went to, to uh, uh, a meeting of the Arctic Council, which is a body that uh, represents the eight countries that have Arctic territory, and they meet every year and uh, uh, make mild decisions about uh, search and rescue and other other useful <laughs> but unfortunately they the, the the eight countries had uh, seven of them were normal scientists but the eighth one mike pompeo decided he'd go along and uh, so <laughs> i mean he has been characterized as a smirking tub of lard and that did actually was quite a good description of him uh, and he said uh, firstly that that 
the Northern Sea Route is a, is a very good thing uh, because of the trade that it does. But on the other hand, it's a very bad thing because it's carrying Chinese goods uh, that the Russians are providing ships to bring Chinese uh, goods from, from, from China across to, uh, to North America. And uh, so and this was a, a threat and America could only meet it by building more warships to protect the Arctic from Chinese incursions. He viewed just putting cargo on a ship as an incursion. And uh, then, then he, he gave an anecdote which was completely bogus about how the first people to the North Pole uh, were Americans from Kansas, his home state, and uh, they got to the North Pole in 1967. And that was the, the first people who went to the North Pole uh, by uh, vehicle. And he said they got there on snow plows. And so I can imagine a snow plow plowing its way to the Arctic. He meant snowmobiles, but he didn't know the difference between a snowmobile and a snow plow. So that was, uh, that's the Northern Sea Route <laughs> as, as you think at the moment. Well, I'm too demoralized to speak after that. Francis, should we move on to Pia? We should, I think, given the time that's passing. So everybody, I'm very pleased to introduce Maria Piehu Casarini or Wadhams, whichever you wish to say, but I think she's going to tell us a little bit about Inuits and carvings. Maria. Uh, now I'll uh, see what I can do with my... Okay, here I am. Okay, right. Um, yes, I was very lucky to be for six years the director of the Italian Polar Institute, the Istituto Geografico Polare Silvio Zavatti, which had absolutely wonderful collection of um, Inuit uh, carvings and artifacts, and it's really a marvelous thing. This is just to show where Fermo is, which it really happens to be Fermo because the founder uh, of this museum actually came. Uh, he came from Forlì in, in Emilia Romagna, but then he settled after the war in, uh, in the Marche region. So that's the reason why we have the institute there. This is just to show what a beautiful village, what a beautiful town Fermo is. This is the main square. In fact, we live, we have an apartment. That's where we spent the lockdown <laughs> in this wonderful place. And um, and this was um, the headquarters of the museum, a beautiful villa, which unfortunately was damaged during the earthquake of 2016. And that's why the museum had closed and uh, it's now, so the stuff is uh, jumbled in another uh, building and uh, anyway, it, it sort of all went uh, uh, unfortunately, it stopped being so important. Uh, I just uh, found this um, slide, which was uh, an exhibition that I um, did uh, called Food in the Arctic, because this Acacia Johnson is a wonderful young photographer from Alaska, and, I, and she had uh, this... Uh, let me use some photographs and um, I had this exhibition within the exhibition called the Art in the Arctic and I just thought today that could be a very interesting person to contact for a, a future exhibition in Clare Hall that would be very exciting and very nice so I can um, sort of help to try and see if she's interested in, uh, which I'm sure she would be. Anyway, let's get to the uh, artifacts of the Zavati Museum. As you see from uh, the ages, uh, from the years, uh, Silvio Zavati went, uh, did five uh, expeditions, 61 in Northwest Territory, as well as 67, Repulse Bay, Northwest Territory in 69, Lapland in 62, and uh, East Greenland and Masalik, uh, uh, now Tasilak in 63. And he brought artifacts from all of these exp expeditions. Uh, I just have a, a very quick selection. Um, this is from Rankin Inlet and uh, basically um, it was a very um, beautiful area full of uh, very artistic people because like this Ultak, 21 years old, 
that carved this uh, from serpentine, this mother and child. Beautiful views of the animals. They really make them uh, in a very beautiful way. This is Naujat, which is also the name for Repulse Bay, the Inuit name. This is a seagull. And one of the interesting things about this collection in the Fermo Museum is that we know the names of the authors, which is kind of rare because really, um, usually uh, carvings and um, whether they are in soapstone or marble or whatever, um, uh, or ivory, they usually they're just done for the pleasure of the people. So we don't really know who does them, but because Zavati was there, he could actually acquire them directly from the artist or from just, you know, the hunter or whatever. So they were not exactly trained to be artists. Uh, like this beautiful novel, this is actually, um, it, it comes all apart. In fact, I took it to an exhibition in Rome and I had mounted it completely wrong. <laughs> so it's, um, it's a very beautiful thing. And unfortunately, I put it in centimeters and not in inches, but uh, I think it should be, it's not very big. Um, this is a quite a uh, um, small one and it's soapstone, all of them from the Northwest Passage. I love the shape of this um, loon. Uh, from Belcher Islands, which are on the southeast corner of uh, Hudson Bay. This is my absolute favorite. It's 33 centimeters, it's a foot high. It's in soapstone. And John Kavik, uh, which uh, was known as the Michelangelo of the Arctic, was actually still alive. He was uh, over 80 years old in ranking England when Zavati bought it. And uh, the interesting thing was that Kavik was born deaf. And so one of his ways was to put his hands on the ears to try and catch the sounds. And this is exactly what uh, he's doing with his arm. So it's an absolute beauty. And um, I was talking to somebody in Zurich who had an um, Inuit uh, carving uh, uh, shop and she was amazing. What, do you have a Kavik? That's so big, that's really, really rare because you don't find big stones in the Arctic. And also on the same, year, Zavati also bought the Okpik, this owl, which unfortunately in the earthquake got slightly damaged and now lost a bit of uh, the beak. Um, we move now to Greenland, a bit following what uh, Sarah was saying. Um, this is an interesting, in, in Greenland you have these tupilak, which used to be some kind of black magic and they were not something that remained, but then for tourism and for having something to remain, um, they don't now have a religious um, meaning. Uh, Nud Peterson was known being totally mad. Uh, he actually did something like horses. Uh, we happen to have this. Uh, it wasn't bought by Zavati because the eastern side where he went didn't actually have this, but it was given as presents to him. And here we have very tiny Tupilax in ivory, um, looking kind of interesting. And uh, this is a very rare one because we don't have wood in Greenland. This would have been driftwood coming probably from uh, the Siberian rivers and then moving uh, with the currents of the Arctic Ocean. So that's quite uh, unusual. Yeah. Um, what like? <laughs> uh, Morris from yeah. Eric Thomason from West Greenland. It was a donation. And this Otto Thomason is one of the best mm -hmm. cars. Uh, in Greenland. In fact, we used this beautiful statue to be the, um, on our co the, um, the coat of armor of the Institute. And Ulu, this is a practical thing, is, is the well, knife used by women to scrape the skin of um, seals to make, turn them into clothes. And this is another well-known singer tat sculptor, Inak Masalik, and Zavati commissioned him this mask with bone eyes and seal teeth. 
22 centimeters high. In Lapland, we have instead a lot of um, wood carvings, because wood and bone, because they have the, the reindeers. And this is a carved knife that was acquired by the Vat in 62. We move to the north of Japan. This is the Aino, are the Inuit of Japan from Kaido. Now they're all in Sakhalin and they're not, there isn't a pure Aino left. And uh, we can see that maybe they're not particularly good carvers. We were puzzled by this um, artifact. And then I found in a book in our library that was actually to hold a moustache when people were drinking from a bowl. So that was a, a discovery. In Chukotka, where Sarah has been, it's a completely different way. You've seen that in Canada, you have uh, uh, the animals, you have uh, in whatever uh, means, um, medium they use. In Chukotka, in uh, Siberia, they do scenes. So here we have a hunter skinning a seal on a piece of wood. Here you have a group of seal hunters. So you have actual stories rather than the individual item. Mm -hmm. And Mother Pear defending her cow from a walrus. And I like to finish off with what I thought was absolutely the most stunning sculpture that we had in the museum, the moon spirit from Alaska, from Whalebone. It was a donation by Jean Mallory, the most important explorer and um, um, expert uh, on, the, especially on Alaska from France. He's still alive at 94, 95 years old. And he donated this, he was a good friend of the party. So here I am, I finished my very quick um, excursion of art in the circumpolar Arctic and I now stop sharing and you can have. Thank you so much, Maria Pia. That was the most wonderful display and really a treat and keeping to such time too was impeccable. But we have now reached the end of the official period of time that we uh, allocated for this event. But a few days ago, we learned that we do have another half hour, or at least um, we've, we, the time allows us that much, perhaps 20, 25 minutes. So we definitely will be from now on moving to questions and uh, answers. First, the first question was from Stuart Helotes, I think is the name, um, for, for Sarah. How many of the languages do you speak and what role does the Northern Lights play in the several cultures you visited? I think she may still have gone oh, to... Yeah, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, yes, thank you, um, Stuart. Um, uh, well, it's a very quick answer, which is none. Um, and I didn't really, sp I didn't speak Russian then. In fact, my last book, many books after that one about I was telling you about the Arctic was about Russia and I learned Russian for that but I didn't really I didn't speak anything then um so it was a question of having translators and just making do which is you know what I have to do all the time the northern lights is of a very um profound um spiritual significance in the lives really of all I would say the circum arctic peoples I didn't speak about um the Sami but I did spend some time with them and um uh when I had my one of my babies with me and kept in a in a, a little papoose like they did and um they tried to wean it in a yaranga one of their tents one night by uh, handing me the choicest bits of seal fat and they said that's what we uh, wean them with I had a translator with me then and uh, I, I said they offered the choicest bit of fat to my little baby and and uh, I said he's not weaned yet and they said that's what we wean them with but I thought that was a step too far um, and they kept telling me how to um, look after him and basically I did what they did although they did say for breastfeeding to put a foil down my shirt because it reflected the weak sun back but that also I felt was a step too far but they the Sami had very elaborate things to say about the northern lights and the role that they played and the various deities is not really the right word the spiritual the spiritual significance the northern lights had and when it came and so on and that was certainly true across all the groups of the arctic and the, the most spectacular lights I saw was just chance really was in um in Alaska, halfway up the, I stopped at a science camp halfway up the um, 
uh, at that route I told you about that long route up to the north of Alaska and we had some really fabulous displays and um, they've got wonderful words in all those languages we spoke of for the different colours. So when I was writing my book I spent a lot of time googling up paint palettes to try and uh, replicate them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, Susie, Sus Susanna Rostas asked, um, what is a tupilac? Or maybe she's asking uh, Maria. Yes. Um, yes, a tupilac actually existed in the shamanic world as a witchcraft, and it was really avenging some nasty thing, expanding some bad uh, thoughts to somebody to avenge, but it was uh, um, always done with perishable things, perishable bits and pieces that were actually put in the sea so that it would reach the person. It was kind of dangerous because uh, the um, negative uh, feeling could also come back to the shaman doing that. Uh, all these, so of course, uh, the original tupilacs were meant to be um, to just get destroyed, so they didn't exist. But the first visitors that went to Greenland from Europe who had heard about these tupilacs were very curious and say, you know, but what would they look like, whatever. And so the Greenlandic people started carving them. But they're now just collectible and hopefully they don't have any negative thoughts. But they are kind of monsters and also mixing human and animal as well. And uh, so, but they are very beautiful collectible um, uh, artifacts now. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. Maria. Thank you. Um, and Donald Wright asks Peter, do you have any faith in the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement? Ah, well, good question. First of all, I'd like to show you my tupilac. <laughs> it's, uh, oh. was talking, this is a tupilac <laughs> in, uh, in Karnak in northwest Greenland, northwestern tip of Greenland. And uh, he is right. Uh, it's, 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 uh, if you, there's a, a, a luck thing attached to it that if you're a well-meaning, nice person, it brings you good luck. If you're a nasty, evil person, it brings you bad luck. So, but unfortunately, if, if, it's, if you're stuck with one that's bringing you bad luck because you're a nasty person, the only way you can get rid of it is to throw it in the sea. And that's, that's unfortunate if you're living in land. But uh, they are, uh, uh, that's, that's the legend anyway <laughs> of a Tupilac. So I've, I've hung on to mine and so far I'm still alive. Um, so uh, UNFCCC, yes. Um, well, there's a difference between the UNFCCC, which is the overall body um, concerned with, with climate change and um, uh, what, what we do about it, but, uh, and that, that's fine, that's doing important work. And uh, they're running these COP meetings, of which the next one is, is hosted by Britain and is now being held next November. Uh, but there's another body that often gets confused with it called the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And that's a more dubious body because it's, a, it's an intergover intergovernmental panel, which means that supposedly it's entirely composed of scientists who are uh, giving assessments of how fast climate change is going and what we need to do about it. Um, but in practice, the reports that it produces get looked over by governmental people of, of all the UN countries. So if you've got one with uh, a, a report saying climate change is really accelerating and this is terrible, we must reduce our fossil fuel consumption, um, and it's looked over by the delegate from Saudi Arabia, it's likely that the language is going to get diluted. So the IPCC, which should be doing a, sounding the alarm on climate change, often gives the feeling that it's rather a complacent body, mainly because it's got at by all these national civil servants uh, so that it can't really sound the alarm in the way that it should be doing.
Um, any comments on the Paris Agreement? Um, um, well, uh, as you can see, the, uh, it hasn't had any impact on, on uh, carbon emissions because uh, the, the, uh, the level of CO2 is going up exponentially, just like the, just like the COVID virus. And um, it's, in theory, the Paris Agreement is a very good thing because it's the first time that all 195 countries in the world have actually agreed and pointing in the same direction to reduce their emissions because it was spoilt by a US leaving it um, but it, it still is limited and um, this is my pet uh, my pet grievance about about all this which is that everybody including unfortunately even Greta Thunberg talks about reducing our emissions as being the solution to climate change, so that if we can reduce emissions to down to zero or near zero, then we've dealt with climate change. The trouble is that, that global warming is already too high and reducing our emissions is all it means is that car since carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere forever, then we're going to continue to warm up. We'll, we'll just roast more slowly than we would roast if we didn't reduce our emissions. So in my mind, the only way to, to save ourselves is develop methods to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's called air, direct air capture. So uh, the thing that various foundations I belong to is, is emphasizing is don't, don't expect we can do anything very much by reducing emissions. We have to, to develop instrumentation to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It exists, it's just, we have to build thousands and thousands of plants that will do that. And Peter, have you got which, which ones do you favor? Uh, which of the carbon capture um, technologies do you think uh, make any difference? Well, I think the, the simply the direct uh, air capture, which is blowing, blowing carbon, uh, blowing air through uh, a collector which contains something which absorbs the carbon dioxide and something as simple as sodium hydroxide solution. Yeah. And yeah. then that, that can then be buried underground or turned into something useful. Uh, here in Turin, there's a, a plant, I think the only plant in Europe, uh, it, it, which is turning, uh, or is going to be turning the carbon dioxide into artificial limestone, which um, wow. can be then used um, uh, as a, building block for uh, concrete and, and, uh, and sand, in fact, for, for building work. Amazing. Wow, that's good news. Um, so I've got another question um, for, I think, probably for Sarah. Do the Chuchi have lots of terms for different colours? Um, she was thinking particularly of red, black and white, or are they limited in the same way as they were for numbers? Uh, I think that they have um, many sophisticated words for colour and all the nuances of colour. Why wouldn't they? Uh, that's my idea. Unless mm -hmm. Susie knows otherwise. I'm not an expert in that, but I think they're able to express their surroundings um, uh, probably in a lot far more sophisticated way than, than we could in our languages. So they're, they're more emphasising uh, emphasizing what they see than the numbers and quantities that you were describing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, well, they're, li they're likely, if I can just come in briefly, they're likely to have lots of terms for snow. States of snow, states of ice, a whole range of colours that we might just call white or brown or something. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are no other questions in the chat box, but I will read out some tributes. Uh, Jane Kang writes, this has been an inspirational evening. Thank you to each speaker. To be in the presence of such knowledge and experience has been wonderful. I tremendously value your time and commitment to this event. I would love to see Maria's souvenirs again. They are wonderful, especially the narwhal and the beluga. I'm so appreciative to everyone who has contributed to making this event what it has been. Thank you so much. So I hope she, I hope she listens to it again in the recording. <laughs> Um, Jane Slimming also um, says thank you to all. You all um, I enjoyed learning so much more about the Arctic. Um, and so does, yes, that's 
that's it. Thank you. Um, back to you, Francis. Well, if we've no more questions, I think this is probably the time to bring it to an end. But I do want us all to thank again, uh, to express, if I may speak on behalf of the audience, a quite exceptional evening with three extraordinary speakers and some fascinating information. We have been listening, of course, about the Arctic, Arctic, and that is, of course, a country that is intimately connected to us and to our futures. So um, a, a subject of the greatest importance. Thank you all very, very much. Leave the